Hello everyone and welcome to this month's webinar on workplace civility and bystander intervention, Essentials of Harassment Training. This free webinar is available exclusively for our customers enrolled in either our Compliance Assurance Subscription or our Compliance Management Subscription Service. I'm Leon Frierson, the Publications Coordinator for Personnel Concepts, and I'm joined by my co-moderator, Karen Jonas, who serves as our Regulatory Monitoring Manager. Hello everyone. Today's speaker is Jessica Merlay, an attorney licensed to practice in the states of Illinois, Georgia, and Washington, D.C. Before launching her own practice, Jessica served as the Tender and Defense Counsel for the Southeastern United States for a large Fortune 100 mass retailer, providing her with extensive experience in litigation and legal consulting. Her current focus includes serving as general counsel to small and mid-sized clients with a focus on the areas of employment law, product protection, business development, e-commerce, media, and privacy law. Jessica has also written extensively for personnel concepts and other companies on anti-discrimination and employment law topics. Thank you, Jessica, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Leon and Karen. I'm excited to discuss this topic today as we'll be covering information on how employers can make their harassment training significantly more effective based on new guidelines from a federal government task force. Today's agenda focuses on the major implications for employers stemming from new guidance on harassment prevention from the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC. The EEOC commissioned a special task force to explore systemic issues that have resulted in continued pervasive harassment in the American workplace. In dissecting the task force's final report, we will cover recent statistical trends pertaining to harassment. We will also explore the report's primary findings on why harassment continues to be a significant problem in the U.S. despite years of legislative enforcement and prevention training. We'll also cover the task force's recommendations for improving harassment training programs by incorporating information on workplace civility and bystander training. Lastly, we'll cover specific topics for employers on how to leverage the new guidance to further mitigate legal risks in the workplace and new strategies to prevent harassment from occurring. The format for today's webinar features a series of questions that Karen and I will be asking to Jessica regarding the EEOC's task force uh, report and the implications for harassment prevention efforts in the workplace. Before we begin, I want to invite everyone in attendance to submit any questions you may have during the presentation by using the Ask Question feature in GoToWebinar. You can also post questions in the chat window. Most questions will be saved for the end of today's sessions, but those that are relevant to the subtopic being discussed will be posed where appropriate. At the end of the session, you will have an opportunity to use the Raise Hand feature in GoToWebinar to pose a question directly to our guest speaker. With that, let's get started with today's presentation. Our first question concerns the EEOC's recent report on harassment. Why was the task force formed and what statistical trends pertaining to harassment led to its formation? Well, Karen, the EEOC spent approximately 18 months investigating harassment in the workplace and it released its findings of, in June of this year. The research was conducted by a task force that was composed of an interdisciplinary panel of 16 experts who started their study based on the assumption that harassment is a pervasive problem in the workforce. This assumption was based on the number of harassment related claims that are received each year by the EEOC. Specifically, approximately one-third of the 90,000 private sector and nearly one-half of all public sector complaints received just last year alone were related to harassment. The culmination of the study found that harassment is in fact even more pervasive than originally thought and that it extends far beyond what is considered actionable under the law or reportable to conduct that may be considered simply offensive or conduct that may be considered unwelcome in light of the entire workplace culture. When reviewing the totality of the harassment-based claims received in 2015, 
the task force found that harassment can take the form of many types of discrimination against protected classes. And as a reminder for those employers listening in, the protected classes are, again, sex, gender, disability, age, race, national origin, and religion. Of these protected classes, sex, race, and disability represent the areas of most complaint to the EEOC and thus were the areas that were most studied by the task force and have been most studied by other entities. Now truth be told, the numbers are actually even higher with nearly 90% of harassment claims in fact never being reported to the EEOC. And with roughly three out of four victims of harassment, never even reporting the issue to a supervisor. Instead, the task force found that common responses to harassment are to avoid the harasser or to deny the harassment, to ignore the harassment, or to downplay the harassment. The reasons behind this failure to report both to supervisors and to the EEOC are driven by fears of disbelief of claims are driven by fears of an action by employers and of retaliation, both by peers in the workplace and by employers. Unfortunately, the task force found that such fears are actually very well founded, with 75% of employees who do report harassment suffering retaliation, indifference, and tribalization. Thanks after for that. The, oh, after, yeah, after the release of the report this summer, the EEOC called on employers and lawmakers to address its findings and to improve workplace training. In today's webinar will discuss these findings and will offer some suggestions for employers on training and other ways to address the task force's findings. Oh, thank you for that. Now, you've uh, mentioned the various types of harassment that are prohibited under current law, including race, sex, age, and other protected classes. What percentage of harassment charges actually involve sex or gender? Well, Leon, if we look at the charts uh, that we have here in front of us in this presentation, we can see that sexual harassment and race-based harassment account for approximately 60% of all private sector harassment claims. Whereas complaints related to age and complaints related to disability are more prevalent in the federal sector. The task force's report included findings about each of these major drivers of harassment complaints. And unsurprisingly, sex-based harassment made up the largest percentage of harassment reported by employees, with up to 85% of female employees reporting having experienced sexual-based behaviors, unwanted sexual attention, and sexual coercion. Now, if we take into consideration workplace culture, the task force inquired further whether the women it interviewed uh, as part of its study had been uh, subjected to crude or to offensive or to sexist behavior, regardless of whether there was an expressed sexual interest in the employee. The task force found that such behaviors created a company culture of, quote, put downs instead of, quote, come on. And as a result of this, uh, such harassment remains a persistent problem in the workplace. The task force's findings also revealed that gender identity and sexual orientation harassment was extremely prevalent in the workplace, and which is actually another topic that I have pre presented on before for personnel concepts. Among other findings, up to 50% of transgendered persons have reported experiencing harassment in the workplace, and approximately 40 or 41% of LGBT employees 
report verbal and physical abuse or workplace vandalism. Jessica, some employers may be surprised to know that other forms of harassment represent such a large percentage of complaints compared to sex or gender. What were some of the task force's findings regarding harassment based on race, disability, and age? Well, uh, most research studies on the topic of harassment have, like you said, focused on sex and gender because it's simply the most common form of harassment that arises and is the most common type of claim that the EEOC receives. Now, as such, the task force was unable to find very many reports and studies or statistics regarding race-based harassment. Up to 60% of minority employees do report suffering threatening verbal conduct, feeling excluded, and being pressured to, quote, fit in with their non-minority counterpoints. Also, despite the prevalence of disability-based harassment claims brought before the EEOC each year, especially in the public sector, there is a similar lack of data for such claims Though there is one study that the task force did find that reports around 20% of disabled employees have experienced some form of harassment at some point. Now, as to your last category, age-based discrimination, the task force was able to find only two surveys that relate to age discrimination in the workplace and together these surveys suggested that up to a quarter of employees over the age of 50 have at least experienced unwanted comments related to their ages. Well, thanks for breaking that down for us, Jessica. Uh, the report also discusses the impact of workplace culture on harassment-based complaints. What are some of the risk factors that can make incidents of harassment more common? Well, so the EEOC report identified numerous risk factors that contribute to pervasive harassment. As you mentioned, chief among these is workplace culture. And within workplace culture, uh, there are several risk factors that can arise. One of those is having a homogeneous or a non-diverse workforce. Now, also, though, on the contrary, workforces where employees are distinctively different or uh, very, very diverse can also uh, create a culture with, um, with harassment that arises. Another risk factor is when you have a workforce that has cultural and language differences. External events. Um, such as bombings or natural disasters that may impact part of the workforce uh, can also have an impact. Um, young and immature workforces naturally can give rise to more harassment claims. High value or superstar employees, such as those employees who may bring on more accounts uh, in such an environment, Again, we see more harassment claims. Where there's power disparity between employees, between supervisors, uh, again, more harassment claims. Jobs that are monotonous or low intensity, sometimes such as factory jobs, those can lead to more claims of harassment, as can isolated workplaces. Sometimes those go hand in hand. And of course, and this probably comes as no surprise to anyone, but work cultures where alcohol consumption or where partying or socializing is really uh, promoted can also lead to harassment. Thank you, Jessica. The report lists several recommendations for employers on how to combat and prevent harassment. What were some of the key recommendations contained in the report? Well, the task force's key finding, like I said, was that workplace culture is the driving factor behind whether a work environment produces uh, harassment and harassment claims, especially when that culture is driven from the top down. The task force's findings demonstrate that harassment is clearly bad for business as well. 
and employees suffer health, psychological, occupational, and employment-related distress as a result of negative workplace cultures. And as a result, employers have a truly a direct investment in preventing such harassment or such cultures as they can lead to great financial and resource strain. They can uh, cause legal costs to be incurred, result in negative publicity, increased employee turnover, and decreased workplace performance. Now, if we consider solely the financial costs, since 2010, employers have paid $698.7 million in EEOC harassment-related claims. Last year alone, that amount was $39 million. Importantly, this does not even take into account the attorney's fees and other costs of litigation that further reduce employers' bottom lines and direct and divert valuable resources. The task force also examined several areas in which further training and employee education may have a positive impact on workplace culture. And this is through encouraging employees and companies themselves to take responsibility for harassment under a quote, it's on us mentality. What is clear is that much of the training conducted as thus far in the area of preventing harassment has been largely ineffective to change company culture given its focus on compliance-based initiatives uh, that seek to merely avoid a legal liability instead of addressing and correcting root problems. And by shifting the mentality underlying such initiatives, the task force and the EEOC hope that employers may move towards a more holistic approach uh, when addressing workplace harassment and, of course, reduce harassment statistics. Among these areas of potential training are two that we're going to discuss today, uh, which are civility and bystander intervention as being the most critical and worthy of further investigation. Excellent information once again for our audience, Jessica. However, some of our attendees may not be familiar with the concept of workplace civility and the growing problem of incivility as indicated in the EEOC's final report. Can you provide some background on the problem of incivility in the workplace? Absolutely. So we can easily define civility in terms of uh, the recent election cycle that we have just witnessed, in fact, today. And over the last year, we've seen that candidates have fostered a negative election environment. We've all seen gossips and uh, threats, bullying, retaliation, and smears. And all of this was done in front of and on occasion to uh, the people to whom the candidates were trying to sell their products being themselves. Though a presidential election may be an extreme example of incivility and its consequences, uh, it is not at all that different than what employers must navigate each day while attempting to cultivate civil, polite, and productive workplaces. Now, the numbers regarding civility in the workplace are actually rather staggering, with some reports finding that up to 98% of employees have experienced incivility, and at least half of those who've experienced it have experienced it at least once a week. In addition to the other negative repercussions of incivil corporate cultures, Workplaces where civility is lacking are exponentially more likely to have both reportable and non-reportable incidents of harassment. So instead of having a dialogue about civility before incivility begins, employers oftentimes introduce workplace, I'm sorry, employers oftentimes introduce workplace civility training programs 
in response to incidents of berating or in response to incidents of bullying or badgering of subordinates or when there arises an intra-employee conflict. The task force findings suggest, however, that employers should consider implementing workplace civility training programs and dialogues on the topic before problems arise in a top-down effort to minimize all forms of harassment. The word civility and incivility can be construed as rather subjective. Some people might find certain behaviors to be acceptable, while others do not. Does the EEOC report specifically define these terms? Well, the EEOC doesn't actually specifically define the terms, because as you're right, they can be rather ambiguous. The civil and incivil behavior can be difficult to define because behavior that is not civil can range from conduct that is aggressive or conduct that is intended to harm to conduct that rather simply makes employees feel uncomfortable or, quote, bad without an express intent to injure. For example, we have one employer who reported the case of a C-level employee, so such as a CFO, CEO, et cetera, who we'll call David. And David routinely insulted the performance of the employees that he supervised, and he blamed them for things outside of their control. Several customers witnessed this behavior, which they found to be rude and which they found to be aggressive. And David's subordinates were actually so terrorized by his conduct that they notified each other when he entered the office so that he could be avoided. Now, though David was a high-level employee, we also see incivility coming from subordinate employees as well. I have another example for you here, and it involves two employees who were both female supervisors of differing levels, and they reported being bullied by their mutual secretary, we'll call Melissa. Melissa was also a female, and she had difficulty with accepting the authority of other women. Now, in the hallway, Melissa refused to acknowledge her women supervisors, to say hello, uh, and she prioritized male's work over that of her female supervisors. In fact, she went so far as to put down her female supervisors to uh, male co-workers, uh, even within earshot of the females. As a result, you can imagine the workplace grew hostile, office doors were left shut, and the supervisors began to suffer the psychological and physical effects of great anxiety. Now, actually, in fact, there's one interesting study that has shown that female employees in particular who are exposed to civility-related stressors in the workplace are 38% more likely to suffer a cardiovascular incident than that of their more relaxed peers. Now, though David's and Melissa's behavior may not be actionable under the law, right, it may not give rise to an EEOC claim, their behavior did hurt workplace morale, it caused anxiety, and it negatively impacted the atmosphere of their workplace. Rather than focusing on legal compliance, civility training is thus really underscored by the idea that employees should treat each other with respect and with dignity. Right, Jessica. Now, to make sure we all fully understand this topic, can you provide some specific examples of incivility or uncivil behavior? Sure. So recent studies on the effects of workplace incivility have included numerous specific examples of behaviors that most reasonable people would find to be disruptive or rude or stress-inducing. And we have here on the slide some common behaviors that most people would characterize as incivil. So one of those, for example, is screaming or yelling. Another is using poor email etiquette, uh, such as not replying to emails sent by others, which shows employees or, or others outside 
uh, of the workplace that you don't care about their message. Uh, sarcasm, especially sarcasm with an intent to humiliate. Arrogance or condescending behavior or comments. Berating or criticizing people in public, uh, whether that be in public in front of customers, as we do see from time to time, like with the example of David, or simply in front of other co-workers, other peers. Using profane, vulgar, or abusive behavior is incivil. Uh, having a workplace where there's any kind of habitual tardiness to meetings and appointments that's tolerated uh, can create a culture of incivility because it shows that there is a lack of respect of others' time. And finally, insubordination. Thank you, Jessica. In addition to creating an environment that is more likely to enable a harassment-related incident, what are some of the other negative effects of workplace incivility? Well, Karen, the task force and uh, the various other studies into the growing phenomenon of society's increasing lack of manners, as we could call it, have revealed the effects of allowing incivility to exist or to breed in the workplace. And they show this to be quite considerable. Uh, the effects can include, and this is just a short list for you, but they can include lowered job satisfaction, they can include overt retaliation, and lowered creativity, they can uh, include reduced commitment to the company and as a result, increased turnover, um, decreased productivity, increased anxiety, which leads to poor customer interactions, lost time due to avoiding the offender, again, such as we saw in the example of David, and uh, I think also one I didn't mention that goes together with decreased productivity is an increased turnover is the um, decreased productivity and lost time, repeated tardiness, and finally the excessive taking of sick days, which we often see really with the female employees. Now, cumulatively, these effects lead to an increase in complaints of workplace harassment. And even when such incidents do not give rise to a claim, employers spend approximately seven weeks a year, which is 13% of the annual work time, dealing with managing employees' interactions and fallout from negative interactions. And the task force did take a deep look into the root causes of incivil behavior. And it found that for many employees, the behavior stems from actual underlying prejudices against a protected class. And those we set forth at the beginning of the presentation, if you remember things like gender, race, disability, etc. Another contributing factor may be the current tendency of the population and of the workforce to assign blame instead of taking personal responsibility, and also the rise of high-conflict personalities. Thus, by promoting civil behavior and by promoting tolerance, employers may cause a shift in the workplace culture and cause also a shift in the underlying assumptions, thereby reducing harassment. Thanks again, Jessica, but because this is a relatively new area for employee training, how do employers go about creating and delivering workplace civility training? Well, to achieve the desired results, workplace civility training should focus on positive education. It, that education comes by emphasizing what employees should do and what behavior they should demonstrate. This is in opposite to traditional anti-harassment training, which plays up negative behavior and what employees should not do. Further, civility training includes all employees equally, and it's not focused on only one class of employees. So, for example, traditional anti-harassment training often focuses on 
um, telling males not to sexually harass females, or on race discrimination-based education that may be provided to a mainly Caucasian workforce. Thus, civility training is actually a perfect complement to other harassment trainings that employees may receive. And then if we draw from examples of the utter lack of respect and polite discussion that's apparent in news and social media comments, Forbes magazine actually suggests four main cornerstones of civility training. Those are one, listen, two, speak, three, respect, and four, know that not everyone has to agree. So in practice, civility trainers suggest implementing and teaching these four cornerstones through the application of real life actions. And some of those real life actions may be, for example, to teach employees to take care to not be rude or offensive to subordinates, to peers, or to managers, to greet each person in the office with a hello or with a goodbye, to say please and to say thank you, or in short, to remember those kindergarten lessons that employees were taught. To teach employees to give others their full attention. Uh, for example, this can mean not fidgeting with email or with phones during meetings to be on time and to be prepared. As we discussed earlier, uh, tardiness really creates a culture that breeds harassment. To respect others' privacy and to not fall into or to encourage workplace cliques, such as a lunch or a post-work drinking group, as they frequently serve to exclude a portion of the uh, other employees whether directly or simply because of the other employees don't take part. To think before thinking, before speaking, or to think before acting. To avoid having loud personal conversations in the office, whether with coworkers or other personal conversations such as on the phone. And actually most importantly, Trainers recommend implementing a zero tolerance policy for any sort of abrasive behavior. Jessica, the EEOC report also emphasizes the importance of bystander intervention training, which is another relatively new concept that most employers may not address in their current workplace training programs. Can you explain bystander intervention training and why the EEOC task force is recommending its inclusion in harassment training? Certainly. So the second positive training technique that the task force identified as potentially being helpful in, improve, in improving workplace culture and in reducing harassment is bystander intervention training, as you said. Now, Traditionally, bystander intervention training has been reserved for sexual harassment prevention. But the task force really believes that bystander intervention uh, initiatives can be also key techniques to reduce and to confront other forms of harassment as well. So many employers uh, listening in may actually be familiar with a, a seminal case in bystander intervention, which is the 1964 infamous murder of Kitty Genovese, which took place outside her apartment in Queens, New York. Now, there were 38 witnesses to Miss Genovese's brutal half-hour murder, but none intervened, as we know, and each assumed that another person would take responsibility to report the crime. None did. Bystander intervention initiatives and techniques aim to correct this failure to assume responsibility or to intervene when harassing behavior is witnessed. Now, the reasons that bystanders may fail to act when witnessing harassment are very important. 
and they must be considered by employers. They frequently include one, a fear of loss of relationships with coworkers or with supervisors, a fear of retaliation, especially if the offender is a person in a position of power. A feeling of lack of confidence or of ability to intervene in the first place. A fear of embarrassment and of being viewed as a troublemaker. And a hope that someone else with more authority will take action, as was the case with Miss Genovese's murder. Now, notwithstanding these fears, between 70 and 85% of people that the task force has interviewed still do report having witnessed bullying and harassment, with many expressing a desire to learn how to address the fears that we just talked about. In the workplace, bystander intervention techniques may reduce harassment by creating a collective workplace conscious that takes responsibility for preventing and reporting harassment and incivility while also providing employees with the skills and the tools necessary to intervene when they view such events. In addition, such trainings may have the added benefit of reinforcing that the employer is committed to addressing and to ending workplace harassment. Well, notwithstanding this, bystander safety must also really be considered and it must also be addressed as another legitimate concern often raised is the fear that bystanders themselves may be harassed or assaulted. And unfortunately for bystanders who intervene, intervene in sexual harassment or in LGBT harassment matters, this fear of they themselves being in danger is actually a very real worry. So Jessica, with that in mind, what are some of the short-term and long-term goals associated with implementing bystander training in the workplace? Well, there are four main goals, again, just like we had with uh, civility training, that have been identified as being associated with bystander intervention training. And these goals are, one, creating an awareness of the problematic behavior. And this can go back and tie in very nicely with the incivility training. Uh, two, create a sense of collective responsibility to take action. Three, to create a sense of empowerment and the ability to intervene in a situation. And to, four, create resources and guides and trainings to insist employees with doing those other three uh, goals. Well, to achieve these goals, bystander intervention trainings traditionally teach bystanders to uh, first directly con confront the offender and to ask him or her to stop the conduct or to distract the offender while removing the victim. And finally, and importantly, to delegate the handling of the matter to a supervisor. What are some of the recommended techniques that experts suggest using when training on bystander intervention? Well, if you've seen the cartoon that's been shared on Facebook recently, that's about intervening on, I think it was a subway, when a Muslim person is being harassed, that's really directly what we're talking about here when it comes to training techniques. So in practice, some actions that can be uh, used are aiming to heighten awareness of harassment and its causes, to foster a sense of responsibility among all workers, to challenge your employee, employees' perceptions of norms and accepted behaviors and tolerances, to encourage employees to speak up when there's language that is used that is offensive or is hurtful, to consider their own safety when intervening, but at the same time to act with confidence 
to use body language to discourage conduct and to empower the responder, to call out the offender by name or by action or by both, to, after an incident, publicly support the victim and create an open dialogue about what led to the incident and what can be done. If necessary, always to call for, call for help and always to report the incident to a supervisor. Okay, Jessica, we've covered a lot of information today, so I do want to encourage our um, attendees to use that Ask Question feature in GoToWebinar or raise their hand towards the end of the presentation to ask any questions that they have for Jessica. Um, but with that said, what do you think are the main takeaways and recommendations for our audience pertaining to harassment, workplace civility, and bystander intervention? Well, Leon, in short, the task force's findings really show that harassment continues to pervade the workplace and that it remains too high of a statistic to be ignored by employers. In addition to the legal compliance education and trainings that I hope every employer listening in is already doing, additional focus on behavior modification and on dialogue while addressing the root of the problem may prove helpful in lessening the EEOC's worrisome findings. By creating a sense of a unified workplace that does not tolerate harassment or discrimination of any type, employers may see great strides in not only lessening legal exposure, but also in fostering goodwill and in fostering positive, productive, work environments. And now, I think we're going to give you the link, but employers who wish to read the task force's full report can find it online, and I encourage you to take a look through it. Now, to answer your question directly, Leon, if there are five things or five takeaways that the employers listening in can uh, take away from this presentation, I think first, one, that the company culture starts at the top and that a workplace is only as good as those who lead it. Second, that everyone must be held accountable from the highest level employee to the lowest. And systems should be in place to require accountability among all employees, regardless of position, regardless of title. Third, policies and procedures are key for this and for everything else. Employers really should implement policies to address all forms of harassment, to educate employees about the policies, to review the policies frequently both internally and with employees. Four, employers should investigate the new training techniques that the EEOC suggests. Um, training of employees on anti-harassment compliance should be implemented and actually in some jurisdictions and in some industries may be required by law. Special focus should be placed again on civility training and bystander intervention techniques. And fifth and lastly, Everyone has a role to play in preventing and stopping harassment. And all employees should be called on to do their parts, to become part of the solution, and importantly, to promote a culture of strict intolerance towards any form of harassment. Thank you, Jessica, for reviewing this information with us. Before we end today's session, let's take a moment to answer some questions from our audience that were submitted during the presentation. Leon will ask the questions on behalf of our attendees. All right, everyone. So thank you, first off, for submitting your questions. Our first one is addressed Denise, who asked, can we please have this PowerPoint sent to us after the call? And I can assure you that they, there will be a follow-up email with a link, and uh, you'll be able to download the full presentation and what was recorded today. Um, so we'll move on to Teresa, who has a two-fold question. Um, first, 
and it's a very timely question. She says, I have to say it, all the examples of incivility were demonstrated by candidates in the election. How can we control it in the workplace when it is happening all across the country? Well, Teresa, I think that's an excellent question. And as you remember, one of the things that can create incivility in the workplace is the outside stressors that are going on. So one, we have the election that's happening. And two, you already may have instability in the workplace. I think the best that you can do is to show that regardless of what's happening, your company is not going to tolerate in civil behavior and train your employees on what civil behavior is, what kind of behavior is accepted, regardless of what's happening outside of the workplace. And um, she also asks if the training is required, and uh, she specified that she is a federal contractor. Well, Teresa, so the training is generally it's not required, no. However, some industries and some states do require uh, bystander intervention training uh, specifically, and some may require civility training. So I would suggest for you and for all other employers that are listening in, to check with your local uh, labor and employment attorney to make sure as to what is in fact required in your jurisdiction. Okay, and uh, we do have a raised hand um, from a Marion Hidley. I just want to prepare you that you will be putting you off mute. So if you have a question, please be prepared to ask that to Jessica. Just a second here. Marion, are you there? I don't hear from Marion. Uh, so we do have another question that was posed by a Lori Jarvis. Will handouts be available after this webinar? Uh, Lori, I'm not sure if that if that question is for me. You will get the PowerPoint. As for additional handouts, no, I have not uh, prepared any. But what I would suggest you do is uh, one, take a look at the EEOC's report. And then if you need bystander intervention training, if you need a civility training in your workforce, there are many companies that do these types of trainings and personnel concepts is one of them. But there are many and there are many resources that you can find online. So yeah, just to follow up in the email that we'll be sending out to our audience, you will see um, information that um, that you can take advantage for as far as this workplace civility training as well. All right, so at this time we don't have any further questions, so feel free to continue to submit your questions uh, via the webinar, and all, all unanswered questions will be forwarded to Jessica via email, and her responses will be sent to all attendees in the coming days. Uh, thanks to everyone who submitted questions about today's topic, and thanks to Jessica for taking the time to answer them. Karen? This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending today's presentation. We hope you found this information useful in understanding the importance of workplace civility training and bystander intervention training in preventing workplace harassment. Thanks again to Jessica for being our guest panelist. We look forward to continuing to work with Jessica on future presentations. And to all of our attendees, thank you for choosing Personnel Concepts as your provider of workplace compliance solutions. Have a good afternoon, everyone.